we're going to dive into the biggest question that most people have, which is which category should you nominate in? So we've split it into two category themes uh, last year for the 30th and for the 30th anniversary, we did a, pro, uh, a category revamp. So the two themes we have are the legacy categories. So these categories celebrate an organization's individual legacy or organization or individual's legacy of environmental excellence in addressing and mitigating the effects of local, regional and global environmental issues. And then we have the other theme, which is the project slash initiative categories. So these showcase the Albertan environmental projects and initiatives that have addressed and mitigated the effects of local, regional, and global environmental issues by achieving excellence aligned to current environmental priorities. So the next slide is gonna dive into which categories fit into each of these themes. So uh, underneath the legacy categories, we have business, community group or nonprofit, education, government, youth, lifetime achievement. And then the project slash initiative categories are water, air, land, energy, waste management, infrastructure, wildlife and biodiversity, public engagement and outreach, and the shared footprints award. So when trying to choose which theme you want to nominate in or which theme of category theme you want to nominate in, you should ask yourself the question, what type of story do you want to tell? So if you want to tell the story of your organization as a whole, you'll most likely want to choose the legacy categories, uh, as this is going to represent all of the projects that your organization has done and the, the mission and vision of your organization. And then if you want to tell a specific story about a project or initiative that you have completed with your organization or with a group, uh, you will nominate in the project or initiative categories. So all of the descriptions uh, with for each of these categories based on legacy and project and initiatives are available on our website emeraldfoundation.ca where you can learn a little bit more about them and that can also help guide you into the right direction into which of the categories you want to nominate in. So I'll pass it off to Gregory and we will chat about what Emerald Award recipients receive. Yeah, just to piggyback off of what Bree just said, um, there is something that we've updated in our nominations forum to support you and your decision making as well. You have the option of selecting a primary category that you feel you would like to nominate under. And then there's also the option to select a second category that you feel like your work might, might fit under. We do provide our judges with the opportunity uh, to move a nomination to a different category um, if it's in the best interest of the nomination. So if it has a better opportunity to succeed in the category and be recognized as a finalist or recipient. Uh, and just by adding this into the nomination form, it allows you as the nominator to give them a hint as to where it might fit best. Um, also, what I what I like to point out is that the legacy categories are really reflective as to what the foundation used to do, where it was a recognized a recognizing excellence within sectors. But moving into the project and initiative ones, now we're open to collaborative work, and a lot of work that's happening in our province is actually happening uh, through collaborations between multiple sectors. And now there's the opportunity for those to be recognized. So, what's in it for you? What what do you receive as an Emerald Award recipient? So uh, as in honor of the 30th annual Emerald Awards, we actually started handing out a $2,000 grant that can be put towards the continuation of our recipients work, or they can donate it to an environmental cause of their choice. You also receive profile for your work on our podcast, What on Earth Can We Do? Uh, the Emerald documentary series, which mark your calendars for actually premiering season three of the Emerald documentary series uh, not this upcoming sat Saturday, but on the 22nd at a free virtual event. Um, so you can see the, the work of last year's recipients through this, through this amazing series. And then we also have our Emerald Speaker Series, which is our version of TED Talks. We also provide our Emerald Award recipients and finalists with specific logos and certificates to commemorate their achievement. And then there's so much more in, in addition to that. Um, which evolves every year that we do the awards. So let's dive in. This is probably why you're here. You're setting off to write a nomination um, and you're just wanting some good tips on how to, you know, put forward something amazing for our judges and maybe have it 
rise to the top amongst the, the other people competing in your category. So, so the first thing that I'd like to point out is that all nominations must be first party nominated unless it's for the Lifetime Achievement Award. So a little bit about that. We used to um, allow both third party and first party nominations to come in, but we realized that the playing field on that was actually uneven. If a third party nominator was submitting something, that would be from the point of view of maybe a fan of, of somebody's work and the access that they would have to information and data, which really support a nomination, would be limited in comparison to those who are coming from the organization or the, the collaborative group um, that did the work. And so we decided to only allow first party nominations, except for the Lifetime Achievement Award, which uh, the feedback that we, re we received was that specifically for Lifetime Achievement, that is the perfect opportunity for somebody to be a fan of somebody else's work. And it can actually be a little bit awkward to submit a Lifetime Achievement Award for yourself. Also, if you previously won an Emerald Award, a uh, question that we oftentimes get is, uh, I've nominated before, or I was a finalist last year, or I've won an award, can you nominate again? And the answer is absolutely, absolutely yes. Um, however, if you've won the award, you do actually need to demonstrate to our judges that the work that you're nominating for is different from the work you won for in the past. They aren't going to uh, recognize the same work twice. However, if you were a finalist in, in the past, I highly recommend and encourage you to nominate again, and you can nominate for the same work. What we have seen historically is that uh, a finalist will nominate several years in a row and eventually become the recipient. And that can be dependent on competition in the category, as well as your work progresses, it might become a you might be able to demonstrate the impact of your work better and bring it to that Emerald Award standard. Awesome. So we'll move into a few more tips here for writing a nomination. And this part kind of gets into the nitty gritty of actually writing the nomination itself. So the very first thing is to start planning your nomination and give yourself a lot of time. So nominations close on February 11th uh, at the end of the day. And so if you start today, uh, that's going to give you a lot of time to make sure that your nomination is as perfect as you can possibly get it. And it also allows you to make sure you have that third party reference because that is a requirement for the nomination. So if you start now, you're able to reach out to different people and make sure you are getting that reference. So when you click submit, uh, everything's in order and ready to go. And it also helps give you time to plan it in a separate document which we have available on our website if you want to do it in a Word document before you go into our program submittable to submit your nomination, or you can in submittable itself start your nomination and then save it as a draft and come back in and then submit it once you're done, which is a new feature that wasn't available last year. So if you are nominating again, nominating again this will be a little bit easier for you so you're able to save it in there. So next is to make sure your answers are clear and concise and bullet points are absolutely acceptable and encouraged. Um, we, you just wanna make sure that you're keeping it because we do have a word count, that you're keeping it really short and to the point and making sure that you're answering those questions to the best of your ability in that, uh, that word count in that, in that frame, so. All right, I'll let Gregory take the slide to chat about these tips that we have. Uh, so, as uh, this is actually a, a perfect segue from Bree's uh, comment about word count, the nomination itself does have a specific word count, and we really have it there to respect our judges' time. Um, we do recommend, though, that you start writing your nomination as though you're introducing it to somebody for the very first time. Uh, this is something that Bree and I definitely encounter as, uh, as a, a charity when we're applying for grants or sponsorships, um, because it's our 40 hours a week, we really um, get into this mindset that because it's the center of our world that our potential sponsor or grantor should already know about the work that we're doing. And I always have to take, take a step back and remind myself that just because it's my 40 hours a week, their familiar, familiarity or understanding of the work that we do 
is probably incredibly limited in comparison. And so starting at ground zero, avoiding things like jargon. So things, uh, words that you use within your organization, an external party probably won't know what you're talking about. So just really going to that ground level and introducing your project and your organization to somebody for the very first time. And I would also highly recommend when, as you're crafting that, make it sound like it's the best thing in the world. Um, you are your you are your cheerleader and you um, your work deserves recognition. So just making sure that you are really celebrating what it is that you've done through the language that you're choosing. Something that our judges are always looking for um, is quantifiable and qualifiable data. If you're unfamiliar with those terms, a way that I like to think about it is quantifiable data is quantities of things, so numbers. So they really want to know, um, an example would be, we have reduced greenhouse gases by X over X amount of years. So the actual tangible numbers of your impact. And qualifiable data is more along the lines of people's response to your work. So we positively impacted our community by this, and this is what they've said. I cannot express enough how important it is to put both of those types of data into your nomination to share your story. Also, as we're talking about word count, we oftentimes get a little bit of pushback on that um, because you have amazing work that you need to express through this domination and how are you supposed to do it in, in a limited amount of words. But what we provide is the opportunity to upload support material, materials, which include anything from a PDF to a PowerPoint, pictures, movies, really anything um, that you can take our judges into a deeper look into your work. Um, highly recommend using those opportunities to expand on the information that you've provided in the nomination. And you can actually take points in your nomination and point reference to your supporting material. So for example, um, as you're completing one section, you can say, for more information on this, please refer to slide six in our, in our attached PowerPoint, or more information about this at this timestamp in the video that we've submitted. So even though the nomination word count is limited, you can really go into depth in your, in your supporting materials. And I mean, it's, it's an oldie but a goodie, but uh, picture says a thousand words. So show our, our uh, judges the work that you're doing. Um, I would also, though, in saying that, caution that um, putting too much information can also go against you. For example, if you have a hundred page document that you'd like the, the judges to read, I'd caution against that unless you're drawing reference to certain sections of it just because your nomination is going to be included amongst many others and that 100 page document will actually probably frustrate some of our judges. So just making sure that you're using that, that supporting material effectively um, and supporting what it is that you're wanting to say. So this, these are kind of our final tips here. Uh, before you're going to click submit on your nomination, uh, you want to make sure, as I kind of touched on earlier, that your answers are directly answering each of our questions. So a really great way to make sure of this is to proofread your nomination yourself. So go back, read over everything, read the question, and then make sure your answer, like I said before, is concise, uh, but also gets your point across and is also answering the question. And then another great way I would suggest doing both of these, so proofreading it yourself, and also having someone who knows your organization or your project read over your nomination, and then you guys can compare notes and see, you know, are we ready to submit this nomination, or do we want to kind of go back and adjust a few things? So once you've done both of those, you've, you've proofreaded it yourself and had someone else proofread it, uh, you can go ahead and click submit on your nomination, but do keep in mind that when you click submit, it is submitted and it uh, does go to us. So make sure that before you click that button that everything is as perfect as you think you can get it. So those are our top tips for writing a great Emerald Awards nomination.
Uh, something that I, I like to do when I'm proofreading my own work and I don't have somebody else to read it for me. Um, one, not the best for the environment, but I do print it off because there is definitely a different experience in reading your material on a, on a printed page and um, actually reading it on a screen. On a screen, we're more likely to scan through really quickly, where in a, an actual document, we're able to, to read it more. So use recycled paper, use both sides, and then recycle it afterwards. Um, I also, though, uh, find a lot of benefit in reading my work out loud. It slows down the process and requires your brain to think about it differently. So um, I would highly recommend doing that that's my my tip for proofreading is read it out loud and um, you'll see you'll be able to see your errors better and uh, appreciate the flow that you have. 